left untouched the biggest segregation of all. It overwhelms everything else and hangs over our entire society, and that is that every metropolitan area in this country is residentially segregated. I've lived in many of them. Uh, there are clearly defined areas in every one that I've lived in that are all white or mostly white or all African-American and mostly African-American. And all of us accept this as part of the natural environment. It's not we think it's a good thing. We know it's, we say it's too bad. But we think it's sort of natural, normal, something we accept. It's not that we've tried to do anything about it and have failed. We've never even tried. And so in order to rationalize to ourselves our failure to undo it, we've adopted the national myth. And that myth is pervasive. It's pervasive uh, across the political spectrum. Liberals and conservatives hold it. Uh, blacks and whites hold it. The name of that myth is we have de facto segregation. Not something that was created by government like all the other segregations that we undid in the uh, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, but this is something that sort of just happened by accident. It happened because people like to live with each other of the same race. Or it happened because private actors, whether they were real estate agents or bankers or uh, private citizens, uh, discriminated in how they sold or rented homes. Or uh, it happened because African Americans happen to be poorer than whites on average, and therefore they can't afford to move to middle class communities. De facto segregation is an utter myth. There is no basis to it whatsoever. The racial segregation in every metropolitan area in this country was created by explicit, racially explicit government policy designed to create racial boundaries, designed to ensure that African Americans and whites could not live near one another, with policies that are so powerful that they still determine uh, the racial landscape that we see in cities all over the country. Just like we have the myth of de facto segregation, we also think we know what public housing is. It's a place where poor people live, where uh, lots of mothers with children, uh, single parents with children, uh, lots of young men without access to jobs in the formal economy, acting out, engaging in oppositional behavior that attracts attention to the police and a cycle of violence that we've seen in so many places. That's what we think of as public housing. But that's not how public housing began in this country. Public housing began in this country as a program for middle-class, working-class families. During the Depression, poor people were not permitted into public housing when public housing was first created. There was a housing shortage, and public housing was created for people who could afford to pay the full rent in housing, and they did in public housing, but for whom there was no housing available. Everywhere, the Public Works Administration and the other federal agencies that succeeded it created segregated public housing, separate projects for African Americans and whites, in cities all across the country, frequently segregating neighborhoods that hadn't previously been segregated, that were integrated. During World War II, the uh, actions of the government intensified to create segregation. Uh, they intensified because uh, throughout the country, hundreds of thousands of workers flocked to centers of defense production, of war production, to take jobs that hadn't existed uh, during the Depression. And the migration of workers into centers of defense production overwhelmed frequently the communities where they were working. The federal government had to build housing for these workers if one of the ships to be produced. For the African Americans, they built the housing on a temporary housing because the explicit uh, goal of the housing was that African Americans after World War II would leave and go back to the South. So they built temporary housing for the African Americans along the railroad tracks and near the shipyards. And they built more stable housing for the white migrants in the white residential areas. Very soon after that, uh, in the mid-1950s, a development occurred everywhere in the country which was systematic, similar, uh, and widespread. And that was that suddenly all the white projects began to develop large numbers of vacancies. All the black projects began to develop long waiting lists. And soon the situation became so untenable, so conspicuous, you couldn't have projects in the same city, some of which were virtually empty, and the other of which had long waiting lists. The federal government uh, and local housing agencies opened up all projects to African Americans. And then at about the same time, industry left the cities. Fewer and fewer jobs became available to the now increasingly and soon almost all African American population in the public housing. The population could no longer afford to pay the full cost of its rent, so the government had to begin subsidizing public housing. Maintenance declined in the projects. Prior to this, maintenance workers lived in the projects. They were paid good salaries and lived in the projects. Upkeep declined. 
the projects became vertical slums that we came to associate with public housing today. Another federal program that was perhaps even more powerful in creating racial segregation, and that was a program of the Federal Housing Administration designed to move white families out of urban areas into single-family homes in the suburbs. At a racially explicit basis, we created a white noose around every urban area with federally subsidized single-family home subdivisions. These were giant subdivisions in many cases. The most famous of them, I'm sure you've heard of it, is Levittown, east of New York City. 17,000 homes in one place. What bank would be crazy enough to lend a developer the money to build 17,000 homes or 15,000 homes in one place for which he had no buyers? We were in a suburban country at that time. People thought the whole idea was lunacy. Who's going to want to live in a single family home when they can live in the city instead? Any of these developers, the only way they could get the capital to build these giant subdivisions was by going to the Federal Housing Administration, submitting their plans for the development, uh, for approval of the construction materials they were going to use, the architectural design, the layout of the streets in the subdivision, and an explicit commitment not to sell a home to an African American, required by the Federal Housing Administration. The Federal Housing Administration even required, as a condition of these guarantees, developers like Levitt to place a clause in the deed of every home prohibiting resale to African Americans or rental to African Americans. These deeds that still exist in these homes today, they're no longer enforced, no longer enforceable, but they're still there. What was the consequence of this? Well, those homes in those days, uh, in all of these suburbs, they sold for $10,000 or less, $8,000, $9,000 a piece. In today's money, that's uh, less than $100,000, probably $90,000. African Americans who were prohibited, prohibited, not that they didn't want to, not because they didn't like living among whites, they were prohibited from moving into these suburbs, and they could easily afford to do so. Any working class family can afford to buy a home for $90,000, roughly twice national median income. Those homes and developments like that now sell for three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 and more. The white families over the next couple of generations uh, gained, you can do the arithmetic, uh, 200, 300, 400, half a million dollars in equity. They used that equity to send their children to college, to take care of medical emergencies, to take care of economic downturns, um, most importantly, to bequeath it to their children, who then had down payments for their own homes. African Americans, who accumulated none of that wealth as a result of this federal subsidy, had none of those uh, abilities. Today, Nationwide, African American incomes are on average about 60% of white incomes. African American wealth today is 10% of white wealth. That enormous disparity between a 60% income ratio and a 10% wealth ratio is entirely attributable to unconstitutional federal housing policy practiced in the mid 20th century that has never been remedied. It's a constitutional violation. Of course, it determines the ongoing racial inequalities we have today.